they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001 when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India and Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Good day to everyone joining us here. On behalf of ICWA, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this very important conversation on the peace talks with the Taliban and what it means for Afghan women. My name is Anvisha Ghosh. I'm a research fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs, New Delhi. Since the signing of the peace accord between US and the Taliban on 29th of February, 2020, 
Kabul has been busy juggling with impediments such as political deadlock, violent insurgency, fragile peace accord, threat of aid cut, COVID-19, all at the same time. Amidst all this, the questions pertaining to the future of millions of Afghan women and girls seem to have taken a back seat. The settlement that the US reached with the Taliban offers no guarantees to preserve women's rights or civil liberties enshrined in the country's constitution. Over the past years, many observers have raised serious concerns about the risk that legitimizing Taliban and their return to some degree of political power in Kabul would mean for Afghans in general and Afghan women in particular. Despite the signing of the US-Taliban uh, peace accord, peace has remained elusive in Afghanistan. The three-day Eid ceasefire announcement by the Taliban and the Afghan government's positive response towards that injected a renewed hope that the political solution negotiated among Afghans is still possible. The intra-Afghan negotiations could very well be the real chance not just to end this two-decade-long US-led war, but the 40 years-long conflict situation in the country. Like all the people of Afghanistan, Afghan women also want an end to this meaningless bloodshed and are appreciative of any step that contribute towards a sustainable peace. At the same time, they are extremely concerned about protecting the achievements made by them in the post-2001 context. Despite setbacks, the progress made by them have been momentous. Through all the struggles and setbacks we have seen again and again, the Afghan women are agents of change, makers of peace, drivers of progress, and today they are in a much more stronger position than perhaps any time in the history. We are very pleased to be able to host this discussion with a host of dedicated leaders who will brief us on women's views, local perspectives and ground realities concerning the Afghan peace process in the middle of this fast spreading pandemic. Some of the key questions that we seek to engage with are, how do Afghan women perceive the peace talks with Taliban? What is their understanding and expectations from the new political settlement and power sharing arrangement that might take place with the Taliban? How do they see impact of COVID-19 on peace? What are their demands from this very decisive period of history? And very, very importantly, how do they wish to be heard on issues which are beyond women's needs and women's priorities? Having invested substantially on the development and capacity building of ordinary Afghans for nearly two decades to various projects and initiatives, how does India perceive the peace talk with the Taliban and its ramification for Afghan women? So without further ado, let me introduce the, uh, our distingu distinguished panelists. We are extremely honored to have Ambassador Amar Sinha as the chair and moderator for this session. Ambassador Sinha retired from the Indian Foreign Service as Secretary of Economic Relations in the Ministry of External Affairs, New Delhi, 2017, after a diplomatic career spanning 35 years. He has served in various capacities in Algiers, in Buenos Aires, in Washington, D.C., in Jakarta, in Brussels, before being appointed India's ambassador to Tajikistan. Between 2013 and 2016, he was appointed India's ambassador to Afghanistan. He also served as ex officio director on the board of Exim Bank of India. After his retirement from the diplomatic service, he has been appointed as the director on the board of Hindustan Petroleum Corporation Limited. He is currently the member of the National Security Advisory Board. Our lead speaker, Ms. Fawzia Kufi, is the leader of the newly established political party called the Movement for Change in Afghanistan. In her illustrious political career, she has held very many significant positions and is currently the member of the negotiating team uh, for peace talks with the Taliban representing the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. She was an elected member of the parliament from the Badakhshan province of Afghanistan till 2019. Ms. Kufi was the first woman in the history of Afghanistan to be elected the second deputy speaker of the parliament and headed the parliament's Women's Affairs Commission. She's an accomplished author, internationally known outspoken advocate for the right of women, children, democracy, and moderate Islam. She has been recipient of several national and international awards, including the Young Global Leader uh, Award by World Economic Forum in 2009 and Times Magazine Fearless Mind of 2013. Our next panel, panelist, Ms. Bilkis Daud, is originally from Afghanistan. She is currently associated with the School of International Affairs, OP Jindal University, as lecturer. She is also the assistant director at the Center for Afghanistan Studies at Jindal Global University. 
Ms. Daud holds a graduate degree in social sciences from the American University of Afghanistan, Kabul. In 2010, she was awarded the prestigious Dea Ade Fellowship uh, for her postgraduate degree in public policy from the Willy Brandt School of Public Policy, University of Effort, Germany. She has over a decade of extensive work experience with local and international organizations in Afghanistan. Dr. Shanti Mary D'Souza is the founder and president of Mantraya. She is one of the leading strategic affairs experts in the country. She is the member of the Research and, Interna uh, Research and Advisory Committee, Naval War College, Goa, board director at Regional Center for Strategic Studies, Colombo, research fellow at the Weltrans Institute for International Politik, Potsdam, Germany, international advisor for Nordic Counterterrorism Network in uh, Finland, advisor for the Independent Conflict Research and Analysis, London. She has held many advisory positions with the government of Afghanistan and has contributed both in government as well as in the social development sector of Afghanistan for the past more than 10 years. Renowned journalist Jyoti Malhotra is currently the editor, National and Strategic Affairs of the Print. She has been a journalist for over 35 years, writing on foreign policy and domestic politics and the intersection between the two. She's especially interested in India's neighborhood and believes that as the largest country in the region, uh, in terms of population size and GDP, it must intelligently collaborate with both people as well as government in South Asia, especially since constitu these constituencies may not see eye to eye with each other. She keenly follows the ongoings in Afghanistan, both in terms of politics and culture, and tries to visit the country as often as she can. Before I hand over uh, uh, the proceedings to the chair, some house rules. The participants can ask questions by logging on into the chat box at the bottom of the page. Click on the guest option, type your name, accept the terms and conditions, and join the discussion. With this, I would hand over the proceedings to Ambassador Sinha. Over to you, sir. Thank you and good afternoon. Well, I think we uh, are missing uh, Madame Kufi. You disappeared from the screen. So should we start? Maybe with uh, Bill Keys. Thank you for introduction. We have a star the panel today. Uh, having served there, I can let me tell you that uh, I think Afghan women's expectations are just about what every woman would want anywhere. Uh, she needs peace, equal opportunity, access to education, access to health care. Uh, and one another thing is that this war, while of course has imposed serious costs on Afghan women, has also empowered them in a way because uh, because all of them have had to lead, have been forced to lead their families, take major decisions. As somebody called it, that Afghanistan has become a shadow matriarchal society uh, because of these. Of course, it has also pushed many of them in poverty because they have lost their bread with them. But one of the most amazing stories of success in the last 20 years is the status of women and their achievements or what have, uh, have, uh, uh, have sort of been achieved till now. A lot of partner countries have focused uh, and, and assisted in this area, India included. Uh, but I would want the Afghan leaders and, and families to speak. So let me start with Madame uh, Fazia Kufi, uh, who you heard that she has been in the parliament. Uh, another unique feature of Afghanistan, by the way, is that it has nearly 30% uh, representation of women in the Afghan parliament, which is what, nearly two and a half times more than India. Uh, and this actually far exceeds the reservation that they have got. The reservation is 25%, but each year since 2010, they have uh, actually elected more women to the parliament. Uh, it's the number two in uh, Asia, uh, definitely number two in South Asia. So, Madam Kufi, uh, the floor is yours. Ambassador, uh, were you addressing me because you were coming very broken last minute? I couldn't hear you. Yes, I said that the floor is yours. We were waiting for you to come back. Oh, thank you. Yes. No, thank you so much, um, Ambassador. It's such a honor to still get connected with um, so many friends um, uh, that uh, uh, we, we are not able to see face to face. And to be honest, I miss all of you. <laughs> 
um, from across the world, I must say, uh, Balqis John from the U.S., from across India. Um, this is a very timely uh, discussion and topic because as we go forward uh, in terms of um, establishing, hopefully, a sustainable peace in Afghanistan, the concerns of women of Afghanistan still remains the concern for what will happen in a political settlement. However, I must say that also um, over the more than four decades of war, women have been the, the, the first victim of, um, of war. You, in this panel, at least, you have two war widows, uh, Ms. Daoud, who lost her husband in the war, and myself, who in a way uh, lost my husband in war, and along with us, thousands of other uh, um, women who probably will not be able to raise their voices. So, um, yes, uh, the going forward when it comes to peace, there are uncertainties, but war has also been very ugly. Uh, the latest attacks um, in Afghanistan uh, has been the most uh, violent in terms of, uh, you know, uh, targeting uh, the most vulnerable uh, group of the society, pregnant women and newborn babies. Uh, such kind of attacks have never had history in our, in, even in the war. So the war has become uglier and therefore I think the war has not only taken lives, but also taking a lot of opportunities. A lot of opportunities from people of Afghanistan in, ge in general, but particularly from the women of Afghanistan. So I think that this is the time that we really have to try and give the um, peace, peace a chance in Afghanistan. So um, the good thing is there are political consensus over uh, peace settlement with Taliban internally. And then also we have uh, overcome the political disputes that existed between the two front runners of the election, uh, President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah, they have now established kind of a, a joint um, government, hopefully, uh, that will be able to give uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan a stronger position. Um, the woman, um, the, the women of Afghanistan uh, have been uh, pushing for over the past two years since the peace process has become more serious. They have been pushing for inclusion in a negotiation, but also their voices to be heard. I think when you speak about women rights in Afghanistan, it is not just women rights. If we really uh, have a peace settlement where women will not have a space, that means all the democratic values that we have been striving for over the past two decades, but also before that, will be at risk. Because how do you talk about political um, inclusion? How do you talk about democracy? How do you talk about freedom of speech? How do you talk about all these basic principles of democracy without ignoring, without not including 55% of the society which are the women? So I think uh, I received these questions that what will be the woman reaction if there is a peace settlement with no woman? And my answer has always been, why do we look at it only from that perspective? We really have to link woman issue with many progress that, that we have experienced in Afghanistan, with good governance, with rule of law, with constitutional order, so uh, with national security. Afghanistan has committed uh, itself to many international treaties, including the Security Council Resolution 1325, that we have to really keep our commitment and we have a plan of action for that. Um, so, um, so woman issue is not just a woman issue for us. It is an indication of all the progress that hopefully will be safeguarded going forward in the peace process. And therefore we are trying to ensure not only women rights are protected, but other issues, values of democracy. It's good that now that in the negotiation team we have five women out of 21 people. <coughs> My apologies. It is not 40% um, uh, of the delegation. This was something we had asked for, uh, the Afghan uh, government to include 40% of the delegation women. It is still between 25 to 30%. Uh, of course, much better than Taliban negotiation team, which has no woman. 
Um, uh, now we are in the process of formulation of uh, the Peace Council and the Leadership Council for Peace. Uh, we continue to uh, lobby for more women voices and meaningful women participation. And as I said, I want to repeat that it's not about women, it is about democracy in Afghanistan and uh, women across Afghanistan. I have been hearing many times that these Kabul-based elite women are asking for their inclusion. Now, my point is basically how many of these men who actually see themselves eligible to be part of these talks and to be part of political settlement in Afghanistan uh, spend 80% of their time in the villages of Afghanistan. Yes, uh, uh, we we are based in Kabul, but we have um, uh, we are in direct consultation with women from villages. We have had the national consultation with women to see what are their demands, to see what are their needs, and based on that national consultation, every woman across Afghanistan who participated in that national consultation, from Kandahar to Helmand, Uruzgan, Bamiyan, Badakhshan, Faryab, across Afghanistan. They do not want their daughters to stay home and look at the beauties of the world from the small windows of their win uh, home, uh, home, as they did during Taliban. They Probably their demand in terms of the hijab is different from what a Kabuli woman will, will want, but none of them actually want opportunities like education, like access to um, social services, like access to uh, political participation, social participation, to be taken away from them. So it's a, it's a national demand for women to be heard, to be included, and not to be pushed back, because democracy will be at risk if women in Afghanistan are pushed back. Thank you very much. You stuck to your time limit very well, I must say. And you are absolutely right. If 55% of the population is not included, it can hardly be called inclusive. But anyway, we have some questions since you have participated in the Afghan talks with Taliban, but we'll come to that uh, later. Uh, do we have uh, Vicky Zaud still or we have lost her? No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I can't see you. So the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes uh, to talk about issues from your perspective. Because, you know, uh, in all these talks with Taliban, etc., the, the voice of women has really been missing. And what exactly they expect mm -hmm. these negotiations to lead to. Uh, and if you could talk about the achievements of the past year, but also the craft. Because if you go back in 60s, the Afghan women perhaps were the most progressive in all of South Asia. From there to the Nadir under Taliban, and now where you are in 2020. Good for the audience to know. Okay, thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. And I, in the beginning, I would like to thank the ICWA for conducting such an important session, such an important topic. Thanks, Ms. Anvesha Ghosh, for arranging this. And since I have only 10 minutes, I will be really speaking very briefly. I will broadly touch upon some points which we can, of course, later on take for discussion. I will begin by looking at how the position of women in Afghanistan have evolved since 2001 and also touch upon some of the Taliban's policies towards women, of course, broadly. And, uh, and end by looking at how Afghan women have responded to these challenges and changes. So, uh, as many of you might know, following the American-led intervention, women's right was a key agenda point. And donors' main focus was also on women. Having myself worked in, an, in NGO sectors for over a decade, and the immediate aftermath of the U.S.-led intervention, I can put that, you know, the strong emphasis of donor community and promoting gender equality issues in Afghanistan. Of course, how effective those issues or those strategies were is open to debate, right? So when we look back, you know, like um, there, are, of course, undeniably, there are lots of progress that has been made in Afghanistan since 2001. Of course, the progress has been in different sectors, but I would like to point out the progress that has been made, especially in health and education sectors. 
as uh, Mr. Amarsena also mentioned. Consider, for instance, the substantial dec uh, decrease in maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates, increasing life expectancy of also the enrollment of millions of girls in primary school education. These are the most important achievements of this 19 years, I think. And some figures for AWN also says that around 3.8 million Afghan women and girls are contributed to public sectors to national police, national army, doctors, university, professors, school teachers, judges, civil servants, ambassadors. And also, if you see women have earned seats in both national and regional legislatures, and women have entered the you know, workforce in both government and private sectors. And Ms. Fawzia Kufi is one of the best examples of these you know, gains that we had. However, this progress has been uneven across the country, and we should admit that. And there are many challenges lie ahead. So, though we had lots of progress, but I must say that all these gains, while they are very important, they are very fragile and reversible. That is what is worrisome. And the fact that the you know, Afghan constitution women's right and human right and also Islamic Republic of Afghanistan don't find a single mention in the Doha peace deal as a matter of concern. So that that is why not only Afghan women, as uh, Ms. Kofi also said, they know like the population of Afghanistan is concerned that how come there are no mention of human rights, democratic values, and our constitution, and also, of course, women's rights in the Doha stock. And uh, as you, many, some of you might know that before the peace deal, there was also a parallel dialogue with Taliban. And some of the Afghan uh, women members of Afghan civil society who participated in this parallel dialogue with Taliban, they have not found Taliban's attitude towards women transparent and encouraging. So even some of the men pointed out that Taliban's repeated referral to victory as a disturbing sign. You know, because victory can mean anything, it can be also a very, you know, like worrisome sign that what does victory mean? It means that they have already won. It means that there is nothing to negotiate about. Right? So these are some of the, you know, like kind of challenges that we also face. And even now, if you see after the 19 years of U.S.-led intervention, if you see that the areas that are controlled by Taliban, Taliban, they, it shows that their outlook to women's rights is not very encouraging. In the districts that are controlled by Taliban, Taliban restricted girls' education till grade 6 and boys' education till grade 12. And also, even the schools that Taliban allow girls to go, they have changed the curriculum. So the curriculum is changed to suit their ideological requirements. Beside that, one of the very disturbing thing that the videos that have emerged of women being, uh, you know, flogged in Taliban controlled area by violating social norms are very disturbing, right? So here, though it is a little bit out of the context, but I would like to mention because, you know, when we are talking about Taliban and how, which, con which kind of values they bring, there is a discourse that there are some beliefs that Taliban is, they are, uh, you know, representing traditional village values in Afghanistan. I would like to challenge this, you know. I myself, coming from that background of, I mean, the village background, my family belongs to that, I would say that Taliban do not represent the traditional village value. Because if they would have represented those traditional village values, then you know, such, a pun such a punishment of women would, have, would be unimaginable as, as it would have activated very strong and powerful norms of Pashtun Wali. Right? And also, if you see that 
Actually, many members of the Taliban, they have never lived in Afghan villages. They are the product of madrasas in Pakistan. So they actually don't know how the village life in Afghanistan is. This is how they imagine the village life to be in Afghanistan as it was actually was, right? And also, if you remember in the, um, in the first years of Taliban, when they gained power, the first thing they did that they eliminated tribal leadership, especially in South and Southeast, right? They gave more power to uh, mullahs than to re the tribal leaders. They eliminated Jirga system. They eliminated Pashtun Wali. So they are actually against the traditional values of villages in Afghanistan. So these are, I just very briefly, some of the policies of uh, Taliban towards women, but also overall towards everyone in Afghanistan. However, it's also imperative to point, to point out that Afghans and Afghan society has undergone tremendous changes since the Taliban were removed from power. If you see, Afghans have got lots of exposure. They are connected to the world like never before especially Afghan women. If you see many of the Afghan women, they have got scholarships for studying abroad, right? They are working overseas. Now they have the opportunities also to work abroad. And also they are presenting their country in UN missions. So Afghan women are not the same as 2001. That is why we must or believe and we must admit that Afghan women voices cannot be and should not be sidelined in the peace process. And here I would like to also mention just to illustrate just two examples of how things have changed in Afghanistan since 2001. You might have heard about the My Red Line campaign. My Red Line was a campaign that was launched by 26 years old Afghan women which sought to give Afghan women a voice and agency to shape the discourse around the peace process. It brought together voices of women from across the country, articulating their vision of just and inclusive peace. So it was a very famous campaign that was actually launched to social media by Twitter, but then it was also um, supported by a UN Women Mission. And then also, the UN mission, they went across the country in the villages to where Afghan women did not have access to social media. So they actually captured videos of women, what their vision of peace is. So each one actually expressed their red lines. There are the red lines that should not be crossed in the peace process. So it's one of the best examples that you can see how the society have changed in Afghanistan. The second example for that matter is that it was deeply encouraging to see Afghan women rise to the occasion following the brutal lynching of Farkhunda on the ground of religious blasphemy. It was like unbelievable to see Afghan women carrying her, you know, dead body. So it was also a very important uh, event in the history. So that's why one must admit that Afghan society have changed. So if we want to have peace with Taliban, peace cannot be on the ground of the Afghanistan of 2002, 2001. Taliban should also admit that everything has changed, right? And for that matter, you know, I, I don't want to take much of your time because I know that we might like discuss many of this point in the questions and answer session also. So I would end by saying that the failure of Peace, many fear will be conflict. And that conflict, in this conflict, women will be the most sufferers, as we also saw in uh, early 90s and late 90s, right? So while a peace that is not inclusive for women is likely to be unstable and unsustainable in the long run. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikis. Uh, before we move on to Dr. Shanti, who has spent considerable time in Afghanistan, so she has interacted with every constituency there. Uh, I would also suggest that uh, keep an eye on the chat. A lot of questions are coming in for the panelists, uh, so that maybe you can, uh, in your question and answer session, you can address some of these. So the floor is yours, Dr. Shanti. How do you, uh, having spent time there and looked at 
mainly political strategic issues. How do you see the, the role of Afghan women uh, has been in the society? And of course, what do you think uh, is in store for them in future? Thank you, Ambassador, Ambassador Sinha. I think these are very important questions and a very timely session of, of a webinar. And I would like to thank ICWA and Dr. Ghosh for organizing this. And having uh, listened to the distinguished speakers, both Ms. Kuki and Ms. Daud, uh, I think we need to understand first what peace means for Afghanistan. One is the U.S. Uh, Taliban peace accord is seen as a moment forward. But my fundamental question is, the peace is for whom and at what cost? So if we don't factor in the cost and the trade-offs involved in peace negotiations, especially when they're externally mediated and without the involvement of the Afghan government, I don't think we see much progress in terms of peace. And this is because, as uh, pointed out by Ms. Fazia Kufi as well, women's rights is not exclusive of human rights. There is a convergence between the two. And having kept the Afghan government out, and uh, the gains of the last 18 years in terms of the democratic experiment in Afghanistan is simply being uh, washed away because Afghan government has not been involved in the process. Uh, without the involvement of the government, uh, rights, especially just not the women's, but even the human rights are not going to be protected. And the second factor, which is critical in understanding how the peace negotiations have been progressing, is also the red lines, which have been blurred and at times have been shifting. So there was this rush to get into a peace agreement because uh, either it's for a re-election bid for President Trump or it could be because they want to see some progress in Afghanistan, which they think the peace accord can get. The basics of the peace accord have not been changing because there is a problem in having this kind of, which has been externally mediated and more importantly, in which the Afghan government has not been included. Having said that, there has been a little bit of involvement of women, and we did see Ms. Kofi uh, with certain amount of engagement with the Taliban. But that question really comes to one's mind is, does it really represent Afghan women in the sense of the women's rights? I mean, has there been any attitudinal change among the Taliban towards women? And I'm saying this because I did meet one uh, Taliban uh, leader in uh, Kabul uh, in 2013. And I asked him this question because he had worked with the Taliban as a deputy chief of vice and virtue. And uh, during his time uh, in the Taliban regime, he was involved in whipping women and not permitting women to come out and uh, people to watch TV and all of that. But that changed once he was in Kabul. And, but that could be a tactical shift. So the key question for us is, has that shift really occurred in the Taliban thinking that tomorrow, if they have to sit in the government with women leaders, will they allow women to be a part of the government or to be a part of those institutions which have been built over the last 18 years? Or are we going to just squander away those gains which women have achieved, just not because they are women, but also because they're humans and they, have, uh, they represent a large segment of the Afghan society? So are we going to squander those gains? That is a fundamental question, I think, which we should uh, cater into in terms of understanding the implications of what this peace accord means. The second important point is also to understand that as women are more visionary in their terms, uh, in terms of having a longer vision of peace and how peace matters to them, uh, again with my interaction with Afghan women, I've seen them on the forefront of things and it's simply amazing the way they go out at the risk of their lives uh, with huge security threats, doing the work that is simply unimaginable for most for most of us. I met provincial council uh, members in uh, Kandahar. I met uh, women parliamentarians like Ms. Kofi and others who do tremendous amount of work to protect these democratic uh, gains. And, uh, and the question again is, are we going to just let this all be washed away because we want peace with Taliban? So without really getting into the nitty gritty of what the Taliban really represent, has there been any attitudinal change in terms of having women in, uh, or in parts of government if they ever come back to government in uh, sometime in future? I don't think uh, we will be making much progress. The third important issue is also about uh, the structure and agency debate because uh, the Taliban per se, as we know in a pre-2001 scenario, 
had this totalitarian view and that again will impinge us not on the women but also on the human rights so the progress afghanistan has made on in sectors particularly in education health and uh, key sectors where you have the uh, women coming out to work and you have children going to school all that is going to dramatically change so that's not just affecting women it's also going to affect youth and it's going to affect the entire uh, decade of, of achievements that afghanistan has been uh, moving towards unfortunately the western media has been uh, portraying a very pessimistic uh, image of afghanistan which i think i would like to correct uh, given my interactions with the afghans uh, there has been progress though the gains have been fragile and can be reversible but there is progress so we cannot let this progress be squandered away or washed away because we want peace with the taliban so the fundamental question is uh peace at what cost and peace for whom so these are the things which i think we need to discuss further because it has to be inclusive it has to cater in to all the uh, segments inside afghan society and uh, bringing that kind of a national reconciliation inside afghanistan first have the intra afghan dialogue going between the various components which at the moment are at holding divergent view and more importantly get the afghan government in the lead because they are the ones who are the who will be implementing if and ever there is any peace agreement so these are broadly my thoughts and i've laid it out so that we can have discussion based on this and i hope i have not overshot my time thanks ambassador sir thank you you made a very interesting point that the uh, the agreement was reduction of american troops in fact i don't even call it peace agreement yet uh, has no reference to human right or any guarantees uh, but to be fair this question has been addressed to the special representative of us and he says that these and the end state we have left to the intra afghan negotiations uh, i find it surprising because us itself had a very serious program to bar in 2015 i think they started this uh, scheme called promote and they had better side over 500 million dollar uh, of course the guard views that it has not been spent properly is a uh, error on record but the fact is that they spent a lot of resources and effort in promoting uh, afghan women and their rights and, and empowering them and if, at least in kabul it's uh, there on display that they have come a long way So before I turn to Jyoti, Jyoti, you have, of course, interacted with a wide range of Afghan women during your visits uh, to Taliban, uh, uh, visits to Afghanistan. Uh, I don't know whether you have also confessed that you have met some Taliban leaders, so you know some uh, in a recent article. <laughs> so I wonder how how do you feel that have they changed or they are just. same things which the international community wants to hear uh and will they actually be willing to share power as they say they don't want monopoly but i think they refer more to the minorities and uh, the different uh, power centers in afghanistan in their reckoning do you think they also are willing to share power with women thank you so much uh, ambassador sinaj Beautiful to act with you and all these wonderful women from Afghanistan, Fauzia Kufi, Bilkis, uh, Shanti. It's so great to meet you again, Dr. Ghosh, and thank you for uh, to Ambassador Raghavan for inviting me to this webinar. I I just want to say that I'm thrilled to be part of this, uh, to meet old friends and to reconnect with new and to connect with new ones. So, as a journalist, uh, I'm really here to hear what. women like you have to say and like i said to ambassador raghavan when you ask what do afghan women want and i think fauzia uh, you know gave us an answer right at the start what afghan women want is is not very different from uh, what afghan men want or afghan children want or just uh, afghan citizens want so i think that's the first point is that this separation between men and women and you know well men and women is perhaps it it is not a great idea because we have to look at in terms of what the afghan citizen wants from a new peace and reconciliation deal and and i think the sooner we start doing that instead of separating or classifying or categorizing different sections um i think 
that might be better. And the reason I'm saying this is because if you look at the Indian experience, you know, we had a long freedom movement then in um, and in 49, we, the Constituent Assembly sort of it, over two and a half years, then the Constitution comes into being in 1950. Now, what does the Indian Constitution say? It basically gives uh, quotas to, you know, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, but there is no gender classification. And I think that might be a model for Afghanistan, which is that everybody is equal. So what you hold the new government to is the um, is to the rule of law. And I think perhaps, and it would be interesting to hear what Fawzia, who is part of the negotiating committee, has to say about this, is that one is that, of course, you're talking to the Taliban. And what do, what do those talks mean? Uh, where are they? What is the bottom line? But you're also asking of your own government, an elected government, which has just been elected recently, is that how are you planning to implement these promises that you make to the people? So, you know, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, if you, if you look at the Quran Sharif, gives women equal rights. Isn't that what we all say all the time? So my question is whether you're covered in a, uh, you know, in a chadar or wearing a, a black burqa or a blue one in Kabul or elsewhere in the country. That's not the point. The point is not what you wear. It's, a, it's of course, it's about what you wear or don't want to wear or, you know, but it's uh, taking sort of society's conventions into account. But the question is about what, how equal are you under the Constitution? If the law gives you a fundamental equality, I think that's the point. My second, uh, and the point is, is uh, partially in response to what Ambassador Sinha says about the Taliban. Listen, you know, us over the few um, journeys or to the uh, to our visits to Afghanistan when we meet people like um, sort of Abdullah Zaif or people like that who are who who say that they realize that they, that there were a lot of mistakes made during those Taliban years from the mid 90s to 2001 five or six years and that they've learned uh, that you know you cannot flog women you cannot that women have to be equal citizens. But I'm not sure that that that's what the new Taliban wants. I mean, if you just look at the, uh, you know, you, you don't have to go beyond Tolo News to read what Sirajuddin Haqqani says, which is that he will continue to do jihad alongside peace talks. Now, what does that mean? Uh, are you going to take Sirajuddin Haqqani's word for um, for what the truth is? They just killed a mullah, uh, uh, an imam in a masjid in Bazir Akbar Khan, which is perhaps one of the most secure places in Kabul, right? It's difficult to walk in Kabul, especially, uh, but in these parts which are so secure, so it's not even a masjid or a mosque which is on the outskirts or where, where pe you know, people are sort of less secure. So I think the question about what people want, whether both men and women, is tied deeply and fundamentally, one is to the Taliban. But I would actually encourage um, Afghan women, and like yourself, Fawzia and Bilkis and, and everyone else, to actually also ask your own government, what is it that you want? I mean, Abdu uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah and um, President Ghani ha have come to a peace sharing or a power sharing agreement. That's a that's a great piece of news for not just for Afghanistan, but for all of us in the region. So perhaps it's time also to, to turn the tables a little bit and ask them, how are you planning to secure us? And um, so I'm going to leave it there, Amarin. Um, and it would be nice for the Afghan women to tell us what's ha the, the road ahead. And I think we, will, we would like to learn from them. No, thank you. Thank you very much. You raised two important questions. That should we look at it, uh, women's issues as separate from human rights issues? Uh, I would generally agree with you that yes, we should never position women's rights separately from overall human rights situation because then it puts you in a confrontational situation with uh, perhaps other half of your own society where I guess men get threatened or feel threatened. Uh, 
And the second, that what is it that the Afghan government wants to do and how it will ensure, especially this government where the first lady has been a great champion and perhaps the first time after the monarchy that the uh, first lady is out in public uh, leading uh, events, you know, a very uh, sort of public face of Afghan women. How is it making an impact? But the question that I also have for them, because, you know, women increasingly, and especially where in villages where it has really been emptied out of men, and they said, how many widows? Why is it that the value system is not getting inculcated in the new generation? Or do you think that is changing? Because as mothers, uh, you are the ones who are the first educators and who can uh, change the attitudes. Has that changed in the last 20 years? While education indices, Afghanistan has done very well. If you look at the social media, you still feel that there's an element of uh, conservatism. Even some of the reactions to this event, actually, if you see on the social media, uh, they were fairly cynical. Uh, rather than coming up with suggestions, they were just critical that, oh, these are only urban uh, cowboy based women who want these things or who want their rights. Uh, so do you think that the societal values also need to change? In, may, I, may I just quickly add another question from my side, which is that yes. you know, there are also so many thousand Afghan women who, who come to India, study here, you know, do other kind of businesses, perhaps. There are thousands of young students and young women students, actually. So perhaps, and here, here is a suggestion, why is, you know, if we can ask the question, what can India do and how can you perhaps pave the way, I don't know if we can or not at all, you know, pave the way for some kind of reconciliation. But how about these Afghan students, both men and women, who are in India, perhaps we can bring them together, you know, and ask them what they want. So, you know, some sort of like a Loya Jirga or something in Delhi or, or maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, like, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to what government of India is doing, but let uh, yeah, yes. yeah. Can I just, very briefly, uh, yes. Ms. I just wanted to know if, uh, the, as um, what has been discussed about India's role, is the Afghan diaspora in India can play any role? I mean, addition to India for various educational programs and capacity building. There's a significant amount of Afghan diaspora in India. So do you think they have a role in the whole piece the exercise? I'm not calling it a process as well. <laughs> So, and second question is, you have been involved with uh, the negotiation process and you have met the Taliban. Have you seen any attitudinal change among them in dealing with women? Thank you. Ashakar. Ashakar. So, I think, uh, ladies, you were uh, all great. Um, uh, Ms. Malhotra, uh, Shanti, and uh, I think no other one would have expressed the situation of course, Ambassador Sena has always stood by the Afghan woman. And as you rightly said uh, in the beginning, Ms. Malhotra, um, uh, Ambassador Sena is one of those ambassadors who knows how to deal with Indian and Afghan women. So in that sense, uh, uh, we are kind of in the safe hands in this discussion. Um, I think there are a range of issues. Uh, first of all, starting from the process. I couldn't agree more with you, Ms. Shanti, that uh, it would have been much uh, genuine and probably sustainable if the Afghan government was involved in, uh, in this peace process of the Americans and Taliban when the discussion started between them. Uh, it would have put Afghan government, the Islamic Republic, the state in a much more different position. Uh, probably in a much more stronger position if the state was involved uh, in the talks in the beginning. Um, however, now some opportunities are lost, but when it comes to the peace, any time you start a bloodshed, uh, that's a victory. Um, so uh, you stop a bloodshed, that's a victory. Now we have, uh, luckily, um, uh, uh, um, a team, uh, we have a a delegation, uh, the negotiation team that represent the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan uh, being led by the state. Um, and it was 
Because of all the efforts and struggles of women over the past two years, that we have women, although not enough in quantity, but we have some strong women voices in the negotiation team. Many people in Afghanistan otherwise, two years back or three years back, thought that peace and war is a man product. It's not something that women should be involved. It was because of all the efforts nationally, but also the friendship we got from our international friends across the world, the pressurized the government to have um, to have a woman. So yes, as Ambassador Sena said, uh, or, or I think Ms. Malhotra, you said, we have two battlefield basically. The stronger one is with Taliban, but internally also we have to really fight to get to where we are. Of course, the, the role of uh, the First Lady is uh, something that we appreciate. Um, and of course, her role in supporting our, our cause, our fight is uh, is something that we cannot deny. Uh, but I think it's the resistance and the resilience of women of Afghanistan. It's the strength and, and tireless efforts that they have put forward. Um, and and for, for us, we actually had to take risk by either being part of these talks or lobbying for in women inclusion. It was never easy for many of us to meet Taliban. People who, some of us have been victim of the governments. You really have to have a lot of moral courage. But exactly for the same cause that we want women of Afghanistan to take leadership, to take charge, um, and to represent that transformed Afghanistan, to be uh, to uh, that that we were in the negotiation tables, we were in the dialogues, and we continue to be engaged. We basically cross the red line zones. You know, sometimes we are set with boundaries as women, and this is not limited to Afghanistan. It's a global war, I would say. We are set ba with boundaries, and we cannot. Uh, cross those limits. And if we cross them, then you really have to have shoulder for that. So for us to be in the negotiation table, to be in the involvement <clears throat> dialogue, we really have to have a lot of work. Now, Ambassador Sena, when Afghanistan is transformed, that transformation is not limited to Kabul. The transformation is probably different in Kabul than it is in Badakhshan or in Kandahar in, or in Bamiyan, but definitely it is a transformed society. If you go to talk to a woman in Kandahar who has never been to a school, she definitely does not want her daughter to be deprived of her rights to education. Probably she wants her daughter to wear a scarf or a chadar to go to school, but she wants her daughter to go to school. When I go to my province, Badakhshan, and I held these discussions with rural women in the villages, the level of information and awareness that I can see among them, thanks to the media, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Uh, you go to Bamiyan, we, uh, during any of these festivals, like the potato flower festival or the ski time, you see great amount of young men and women Afghan who represent the transport of Afghanistan. So it's a very invalid point when they say that these claims are Kabul-centric. It is not Kabul-centric. It's a demand that comes across Afghanistan. There are these elements who would like to invalidate women voices by calling them Kabul-centric. While if you go to uh, and, and I want to repeat my point again. How many of these men actually come from the villages who see themselves eligible to be in the negotiation team? At least a uh, woman of Afghanistan can deliver, can be accessible, and based on many surveys, people seem to be very happy with their female parliamentarians. Then, then they're in my constituents. When I ran for parliament, I actually beat all these kind of big leaders, I would say, um, so this is a this is not a very relevant claim to say that the, the demands are Kabul centric. Uh, when it comes to change of um, uh, Taliban perspective, um, 
I think we have to differentiate uh, uh, between the two. The first thing is Taliban have now sat down with women who represented their country, who represented a transformed Afghanistan. Unlike 20 years back, which most of these women were wiped on the streets of Kabul, being beaten up for their uh, outlook, for their dressing, for their the way of their clothing, for their burqa, for the color of their burqa. They were being whipped on the streets of Kabul. But they sat with the same woman and listened to them. So I think that's a change itself. That's a change. But I never take this for granted that it's an indication that that women will have the same rights and opportunities that constitutionally we have today uh, in a peace deal. We have to really watch the situation carefully. We have to really uh, follow through every step, not only to ensure women rights, but as I repeatedly said, and Ms. Malhotra and Ambassador Sena said, to ensure all the gains that people of Afghanistan have. But I'm not saying there are no problems. I'm not saying that women of Afghanistan are not suffering from violence. We have seen some horrible scenes and footages of violence against women lately in our history, lately, just last, last year, last month, last week. This continued to happen. But the difference is we speak up when we are the victim. We have that space to raise our voice, to protest, when we see there is a violence happen. This is unlike 20 years back, which we could not really speak up and raise our voice. So not everything is perfect now, but all, I mean, already women of Afghanistan are suffering. Afghanistan is the worst place to be a woman. How much more shall we pay for the cost of war, a peace? I think we have already paid a lot. We should not be asked to pay more for this. Thank you. Uh one more question. You see, Taliban has been very evasive when they have been asked this question about rights for women. All they have said is that whatever is guaranteed by Islam and assured by Sharia would be there. Uh, obviously, they don't even accept the current Afghan constitution, so I don't think we can go by these assurances. But suppose I had to ask you a question, that if this formulation, uh, will you accept as an Afghan woman, as an end state in Afghanistan, you would want where the rights of women granted by Islam, right from right to work to right to education, are protected, and their merit is the basis of equal opportunity. Now, will they accept this sort of formulation and commit themselves uh, to this? Uh, this will also have many hurdles. But do you think they have come to a position where they would be willing to do this? And secondly, Perhaps there's a need to re-educate them uh, about Islam itself. Because Islam itself has a lot of uh, amazing stories of uh, women leaders. Absolutely. So either of you would like to respond. Uh, do you want me to or do you want Ms. Dawood? Whoever, I, you can, uh, whoever wants to take this question. Okay. Oh, um, uh, yes, um, uh, when it comes to the interpret uh, women rights interpretation according to the Islamic values, uh, Ambassador, we uh, always have different kinds of interpretation on different issues. So this has been my point when I met uh, Taliban, uh, twice in Moscow, but also in Doha, that we have to be specific on, on when we say Islam, women rights within Islamic values. We are already an Islamic country. Our constitution is Islamic. And based on the uh, analysis that has been done in our, uh, about our constitution, uh, uh, through, uh, by some of these Islamic uh, scholars, uh, they found out that there is no contradiction of the current constitution with Islamic values. So um, we are an Islamic country under an Islamic constitution. We really have to make it clear what does it mean when we say women rights according to Islamic values. Um, but also we have to remember that uh, we have international commitments as well. We have post-peace agreements. We have to live with the world. We have to live with the region. We have to live with the world. We cannot disconnect. And I think many of these donor funding, Afghanistan depends on, on that so much, 
relationship or by bilateral relationship depends on how the post peace agreement will look like in terms of the uh, civil liberties, in terms of the rights of people, including women. So I think all sides should be alerted in terms of um, how they will shape their politics when it comes to acceptance of equality of gender in Afghanistan. Well, that's true. If I also want to uh, add a little bit in what Ms. Kofi said, that that's very true that when we are talking about women's rights in Islam, we must be very careful because there are different interpretations of it, right? So, for example, Taliban also said that they are uh, um, respecting women's rights in Islam, but they have a very restricted or conservative view of it, right? We also have some moderate uh, Islamic interpretation. So that's a very kind of, you know, like crucial issue. One has to be very careful how to define women's rights in Islam. And also Tal Taliban, what they say and what they do are very different. If you see in February in Moscow talks, they clearly say that they are committed to uh, upholding women's rights and that the Islam, which are their rights to education, work, health, inheritance, and even choosing one's husband, right? But what they do in action, what they do in action is very different. So there is no guarantee. For example, what happens in their uh, controlled area by Taliban is very different from what they say. And on one hand, they are saying that they are respecting women's rights in Islam. And on the other hand, they also say that what is called women's rights in Afghanistan, it's called the spread of immortality, immorality. Careful that how to define women's rights in Islam. Thank you. Uh, you see, I noticed that uh, while I open this to the audience, uh, a number of questions that they had raised you have already addressed in terms of whether Taliban has changed their attitude, uh, what strategies to adopt, what government wants to do. Uh, but a few others, I'm going through these questions and I'll ask you that what do you think Somebody has asked that the international community needs to do uh, to continue to empower the Taliban. Uh, one thing is clear that this time around the Taliban is at least conscious of its need to engage with larger number of countries. Last time they were happy with recognition of just three. This time they have reached out to many more countries. Uh, uh, some have engaged uh, directly and openly, and I guess they have sent feelers and messages to others also. Because if they want to govern the country, they have to have a plan in terms of what they will do in terms of the economy, how will it be sustained, will they want, they have also said that they would want international cooperation to continue. So obviously there are certain changes you can see in their dialogue. Uh, but of course, sitting here, it's very difficult to judge, and, and of course, everything has to be taken with a pinch of salt. But what role international community you feel can continue to uh, have in Afghanistan uh, when the, whenever this Afghan talks leads to a certain new dispensation? Would you like to answer? Uh, well, um, yes, I, I think uh, before that I also want to answer one other question that was also yes. related to Please. this. That someone asked that uh, how a sustainable peace can come, you know. So I would like to say that there are many elements to sustainable peace. And one of the important elements of sustainable peace is gender inclusiveness. So whatever uh, political agreement or political, you know, arrangement will be done after the um, talks, I think it should really consider the social inclusiveness in terms of race, religion, uh, ethnicity, gender, and also those political settlement that is uh, will be arrangement that will be done. It should also take into account the social diversity of Afghanistan. And also the change that has been there, as Ms. Kofi also said, that the Afghan society has changed. I also mentioned in my presentation. So any political settlement that is taking place, it should consider the change that the um, Afghanistan society has undergone. And at the same time, the international community, international community, the important thing what they can do is that 
whatever they have committed after 2001, they should also stand to those commitments, right? One of the commitment was, one of the important commitment, commitment was women's right. But beside women's right, like the overall, if you see about human rights, right, it was an important factor of bringing democracy in Afghanistan by international community. So they should be very careful, the international community, that while they are dealing with Taliban or while they are doing any kind of political settlement, they should not kind of um, forget the commitment that they did when they wanted to withdraw the Taliban. So all those commitments should be there, right? We cannot kind of erase the 19 years of uh, intervention. So those commitments should be there in any political settlement that is coming. It should be socially and uh, inclusive. Thank you. Um, uh, Jyoti, there's a question perhaps you would like to take. Uh, uh, that do you think that the issue of gender or the issue of women's rights in Afghanistan has a certain South Asian character fixed to it? Actually, that's a great question. And, you know, as I was thinking about this uh, right at the start, when you mentioned, I think, Amar, that Afghanistan has a quota um, in, the, in their parliament. It's a 25% quota for women, but there are more women elected. There are about 30% women. So that's really fascinating. How did that happen? And I would actually say that, um, you know, Pakistan also has a quota, but India, for some reason, uh, refuses to engage with a quota. You know, we've got into all kinds of other complications about caste and uh, sort of, you know, tribal quotas, etc. But, you know, leave that aside. But I think the, the question of South Asia being uh, sort of a traditional, traditional conservative uh, male stranglehold uh, on politics on uh, on custom on life that's that's a that's very very true that's a given but i i come back to the question of the constitution the indian constitution for example which is such a uh, egalitarian document gives you the right to equality rule of law etc and and i suspect that, and i hope that that's what will also happen in Afghanistan. So I think, you know, I mean, I'm not going to venture into the politics of Islam or what it means and what it doesn't mean. But I also feel that there is something to say about, you know, a document that incorporates all these, all religions of ethnicities, etc. And And I think, you know, that's what the Taliban keeps saying, my interpretation of Islam versus your interpretation of Islam. Now, whose interpretation are we going to is is going to be the, on the cutting edge? Suppose somebody goes to court. What is the right of a woman? Is it one fourth? Is it half? Is it three quarters? I mean, so in a new Afghanistan, I think that's what you know. Women like you have to do. Have to stand up for. Uh, Ambassador, I wanted to. Um Kind of point out to the point you 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 mentioned earlier about um, you know Taliban. There is a quote I, from you. I would like to repeat: um, "Govern." So I hope. Um, well, you see, if you look at the history of peace talks, um, at least uh, uh, for the past maybe 30 years since 1990s when the Geneva peace agreement happened in 1988, there was no um, Afghan, uh, there was no Afghan side's involvement. It was not a thorough process in which uh, different sides will sit and talk about their differences and agree on a power sharing arrangement. And therefore we witnessed the civil war being, you know, kind of led to Taliban regime. This is exactly something we, and, and, and that Afghanistan was not in the interest of its people. It was not in the interest of the region. It was not in the interest of our neighbors. So uh, it's exactly the same scenario we would like to avoid. And how can we avoid that? Uh, it's only by, you know, start of intra Afghan negotiation and talking about all these a to Z of our differences and questions we have in the negotiation table. So 
we already have a kind of roadmap for ourselves on the points that we would like to uh, agree upon. Uh, the, the, from the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan delegation points of view, we are willing uh, to, um, uh, to, to attend this process with a, a good willing. Uh, gratitude. We are, um, and we would like to take some steps to build trust. And that's why you have seen that uh, lately uh, some prisoners were uh, were re released. In the meantime, we would like Taliban to uh, take some steps. They have announced ceasefire. Um, there are targeted assassination and killing. Uh, as Malhotra mentioned about one of the very prominent Islamic uh, moderate uh, clerks so who had been assassinated two days ago in Wazir Akbar Khan, and he was a moderate uh, clerk and uh, kind of a popular uh, one in the mosque, inside the mosque. So I think we really need to have some steps to by Taliban also to come forward and indicate that they are willing uh, willing to, uh, to be part of this process and be and come with a uh, with an open shoulder, we have the say, with an open shoulder, so people trust him. And we have to create a situation where nobody will feel uh, that they have lost. Um, the Afghan side, the Islamic Republic side, and the Taliban should actually be able to agree on a peace agreement that they both should feel that they, have, they are the winner. Uh, both sides is the winner. Because we don't want uh, an imposed peace agreement as it was in our history and failed. And I think once we have had this agreement with ourselves, uh, then we have to really go for a, um, uh, you know, for a, for a defined strategic relations with our, uh, with the region. Because with, and with the world, without international support, it is definite that Afghanistan political uh, settlement will not survive. It's obvious. Um, and uh, right now, I think the Afghan uh, diaspora and also the Indian diaspora in India can um, can help um, in terms of mobilizing for the peace process. Because I think there is no alternative, uh, Shanti, at this stage. Um, to support the process and give it a chance because why we have to do this because we have no other choice otherwise the same history will be repeated when the international the Russians withdraw from Afghanistan and Afghan government collapse eventually and uh, the Mujahideen took over civil war began and then Taliban uh, started to raise so I think we want to avoid that scenario because that scenario is not in the interest of anybody and therefore, I think we have to really support this and make sure that everybody feels satisfied in the process, that, that nobody's interest is at risk, and that nobody's interest is being uh, ignored in the process. And that is the responsibility of all of us. And lately, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually started a kind of a regional um, uh, co collaboration to mobilize consensus and mobilize the countries uh, on this process, and I think that will hopefully give an assurance to our regional countries that um, you know we will work with them in this process. Ambassador, you are muted. Uh, you are muted. We can't hear you, Ambassador. Sir, no, you are muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, somebody has asked a question. Uh, do you think uh, making peace with Taliban and handing over victory to Pakistan, is that your perception? And the second question they have asked is, are you happy with the current uh, role of Afghan women in decision making, policy making, etc.? Is this to me, Ambassador? Yes, Ambassador. You or Bilkis, can you hear? Um, uh... If I will start from the last. Are we happy about the role of women in the decision making? I think attempts have been made to bring women in the high level decision making. Uh, we have women ministers, uh, women ambassadors. Some of these women ambassadors have been role model. Um, but uh, going forward, uh, we are in the process of um, 
formulation of the government. Uh, the two leaders have agreed, um, the two kind of campaign teams have agreed to um, form a new government. Uh, we are hoping that there will be more women as ministers, but also more right women. It is important to bring more women, but also right women, because, um, and right people in the right position, not only women. Uh, I'm not saying any, uh, all women are right, but sometimes when you uh, bring women who do not have the required uh, capacity, courage, knowledge, that can backlash. So um, we are hoping that there will be, that this quote of two, three women minister will be now break, uh, bro, uh, in the new government. That will be uh, not the norm anymore. And we go beyond two, three women minister. Hopefully we'll have more women ministers. But, uh, but more importantly, uh, we have more um, uh, women in the Peace Council because the Peace Council makes the policy for peace, the roadmap for peace. And it's important we have more a strong woman, prominent woman in the peace process, and hopefully more women also in the lo local level decision making as well. Uh, as as uh, Ms. Malhotra said, uh, in the parliament, the, 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 the quota is 25%, but we have something between 27 to 28% of women who have been elected, not based on quota, 25% uh, based on quota, but 2-3% more than that uh, on general C. That is an indication of how transformed the society is, how transformed uh, Afghanistan has become. I'm not claiming that that transformation is uh, uh, across Afghanistan. Yes, there, there are the extreme part of the society who will still hold back the progresses, but I think comparing to the progress, we have the, 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 the transformation, the new voices, the conservative who want to hold back Afghanistan will be weak. It's just enough if you remove, if you take away guns from them. They will lose their constituents. No, that's well said. In fact, uh, not only in Afghanistan, I think uh, answering the other question, the whole of South Asia, progress has been perhaps slow. Uh, it can only be incremental. Uh, obviously, much has been achieved, uh, but we can always do better. The important thing is that whatever you have achieved becomes irreversible. Uh, and I think that will be the test of what this peace deal is all about. There are certain questions which I think are addressed to me. I'm not supposed to be answering questions. But let me quickly answer that, you know, India realized that empowering Afghan women was absolutely essential right from the beginning. If you go back, one of the first development uh, projects were done by SEVA. And, uh, in Bhagat Zarana about empowering women, uh, teaching them the basics of how to become self-reliant, right from accounting to business to entrepreneurship. And that was a very successful program. It has continued till now. Then through our scholarships, we realized that educating the girl child or the women, uh, which were particularly sort of uh, underprivileged, let's put it this way, or discriminated against, uh, that we managed, and, and that I am saying that it was a credit to us, but we managed that out of the thousand scholarships, at least 100 were girls. And we achieved it sort of three years in a row. And reaching 100 itself was a challenge, because you didn't have enough volunteers. In fact, uh, we used to rely on Madame Kufi and other women uh, leaders uh, to actually recommend. We had to change our policies. Because uh, Ms. Kufi will know, this was a classic example, that the parents would not let an uh, unmarried girl go. Uh, she was married, and we made sure that the husband also got a scholarship, so both came. Uh, then we, we sent brothers along with sisters, because otherwise we couldn't come. So we made conscious tweaking of our rules to make sure that more and more girls uh, come and get educated. Some of them are I'm doing absolutely outstandingly well. So that sort of commitment to international community will have to continue. Uh, West, in any case, has conditionalities attached to its aid, and they do focus on women empowerment. That would happen. But in defense of Taliban, let's put it this way, that even Taliban, you see, the situation is not what it was in 1996-2001. Afghanistan is very connected right, in the rural network. Their 4G works better than in, works in Delhi, by the way. Uh, so the genie of this awareness has come out of the bottle, and it will not be easy to put it back. 
and put it back into the activities again. Uh, that thing, I'm sure. Former Taliban, various Taliban-related families, we know how much stress they give on their own children coming to education for education to India. And they all want to come and learn engineering, etc. Because they also realize that in the current world, I think for their next generation, they need education. And they have understood the importance of education, how they will translate into policy, uh, we will have to see, because they also have to respond to their own uh, sort of more uh, conservative constituencies. But uh, So perhaps it's tactical that they're not putting all their cards on the table right now. But believe me that we have sent many, many children directly from Taliban families, and they've all come to India for education. And each of these students have have been able to influence their own families uh, when they go back, uh, mostly for uh, better. What was the other question in terms of what role India could play vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, etc.? You see, when all of us agree at least that this entire process needs to be Afghan owned, and only recently we said that ultimately the policies will have to start corresponding with the public statements. Uh, that we would, uh, Pakistan has a very important role in whatever outcome you will have in Afghanistan. But that role needs to change. I think uh, that is a realization that not only we have in India, but I think every Afghan will tell you the same thing. That uh, And Pakistan can have a very uh, positive influence, but it will really have to change the policy that has followed in the last 18 years if we want to have uh, peace in Pakistan and any development. Uh, India's role today would be basically, first, of course, uh, getting all the Afghan factions together, a uh, good fortune that we have friends across the spectrum, and sending out messages to Taliban also that there is a uh, benefit for them also, that if they need, and if they want recognition and support of uh, a regional partner like India, I think they will also have to change, and that is an important message we have to give. Uh, the other message we have to give them that the international community has not given a blank check to Taliban. Current engagement notwithstanding, uh, these things will change if they actually reverted back to, uh, to the, uh, to the earlier uh, ways of uh, function. Because, and but women here, of course, is very, very important because the most iconic or lasting images of Taliban regime is basically how women were treated. And that is why this great hesitation and worry about how they will uh, reintegrate, how they will try to be part of the system. And I agree with Ram Kufi that, you know, these negotiated power sharing deals are not the sustainable models. Ultimately, they will have to get approval of the people and this only way is to put down your weapon and then see how much appeal you have in the masses and whether but of course democracy as, as of now seems an anathema to them uh, so i don't know whether how they will move towards uh, uh, reintegrating how they will lay down arms what will happen to the fighters will they be reintegrated with afghan defense forces so there are lots of questions there was one question about American objective. American objective was very clear uh, that they have negotiated a deal for reducing their troops and they have left the rest of the negotiations to the Afghans. And I think perhaps uh, that is the right way and it's for the Afghans. And it's not going to happen in one, six months or one year. It will, it will, it needs a lot of healing and reconciliation, uh, forgiveness and forgetting on both, both sides. Uh, only then they will, but at least a common minimum agenda that what should be the end game or, or the end state. There should be a common understanding among Afghans now, and it doesn't have to be uh, a secular government because it's an Islamic society, it's an Islamic constitution, and I don't think anybody in the world will have a problem with that. But the problem really is what sort of Islam, what is their interpretation, and what is the type of Islam that they would like to impose? That I think is something which, uh, not only the international community, but it concerns the Afghans primarily, and uh, they have to accept uh, the conditionalities. So I think I'll stop here, and I, we are reaching end of our time. Also, Anvisha. Yes, absolutely, sir.
Uh, thank you very if much. Any of the panelists would like to have a minute each of comments to round up? Or let me ask a question. How hopeful are the Afghan delegates that intra-Afghan negotiations will start soon and it will lead to a positive outcome? Um, uh, we are we, uh, we are hopeful um, that it will they will start soon. Now, how soon? Uh, no one knows that. Of course, we are faced with many challenges, uh, including the COVID nineteen, uh, which of course um, impacts our face to face meetings globally. Uh, but uh, the negotiation team is kind of prepared. We are ready um, to uh, start the talks. But Ambassador, you mentioned, uh, I know that we are in the last minutes, you mentioned of the um, great examples of how uh, we all supported women to go to get education in India. I remember there was this girl uh, whom you, uh, I recommended and you supported in the scholarship. Uh, she was coming from a village that is under control of Taliban, Warduj district in Badakhshan. And um, I remember until she get to the plane, her father used to call me. Her father took her to the airport and called me that, Miss Kofi, can you get her out of the plane? Because I cannot go back to my village. Um, and I said, no, now the plane has took, uh, taken off and I cannot do anything. After, um, after she came back, she is now working as a consultant with World Bank. Uh, actually, I kind of lost contact with her, but she came to see me the other, uh, I think, two, three months ago. She's uh, working as a consultant, good pay. She's supporting the whole family because her father is now in, in, in Warduj, which is not under control of Taliban anymore. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the father is there, the rest of the family are in Kabul. So this is a real kind of uh, 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 live example of uh, woman empowerment. We, and I remember many women that we sponsor, you sponsored and we recommended with their husband went to India and came back now with the work. This is real empowerment uh, examples of women. No, thank you very much. Uh, you have not only been an activist, you have actually worked. And I must uh, congratulate her and publicly say that she was one of the great, uh, sort of, she really pushed us hard uh, to make sure that more and more women went and we reached 10%, which was a huge from actually zero. Practically zero. We in three years we brought it to 100. Uh, of course, we also had to reduce the eligibility criteria a bit to encourage. But I think that all these efforts by international communities will pay results, and we are hoping for that. Anything else, Jyoti, Shanti, Ilkis? I just wish all all of you all the best in your negotiations with the Taliban. Tell them to come back and elect themselves. Then we'll see. And there are, of course, there are many questions. They're all interrelated, but if you actually started addressing each one of them, we hear in a couple of hours. So, but I think the panelists have covered more or less these aspects. With these words, I think we thank ICWA. It's a great uh, opportunity. And maybe ICWA could do a webinar, uh, what they call the Web Jirka of the Afghan diaspora in India. And we we'll need volunteers like Jyoti and Shanti to get them together and to see what they have to say. Maybe in times of COVID, it might be easier to organize that. They're all at universities. They all have access to internet. So maybe we should do that. Thank you, sir. And thank you all the very best. And take care. I'm so sorry. And I think I got distracted. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure all of you would agree that this has been a wonderful session. On behalf of ICWA, <laughs> I would like to thank uh, our distinguished chair and panelists for taking out time from their packed schedule and joining us for the webinar. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to the participants who have joined from different parts of the world. The webinar would not have been possible without the valuable guidance and support of Director General ICWA, Dr. T.C. Raghavan. I would also like to thank Deputy Director General, Mr. Shoman Bhakti. My sincere thanks to Ms. Nutan Kapoor Mahavar, JS ICWA and her office for their constant support towards the preparation of this seminar. I would be failing in my uh, part if I don't express my gratitude to the research wing of ICWA, starting from Director Research, Dr. Nivedita Ray, and my colleagues for their 
valuable inputs and support. A special thanks to my colleagues at the IT and seminar section for ensuring the smooth running of this webinar. With this, I would like to close my remarks and uh, announce the end of the webinar. Once again, thank you and Tashakur for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.